Fantastic. Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A warm welcome to the people of Derby for our third session as Art of Brilliance, Brilliant Derby. It's actually a pleasure. My name's Sandra, you can see at the screen there. It's actually fantastic to be here with you today. And um, Brilliant Derby has got off to a wonderful start. I saw, I checked up the videos on the YouTube page recently, and there's a lot of views, a lot of engagement, which is great. And also recently, I've seen which we're going to share at the top now. The, the email address has been inundated with people suggesting what we can do to, to make Brilliant Derby as brilliant as possible, but also in terms of your contributions for how you can get involved, whether that's in front of the camera, behind the camera, presenting content, facilitating content. There's so many ways that we can all make Brilliant Derby brilliant together. That If you are one of those people who would love to get involved, please feel welcome to uh, send an email to the, to the link up here. But also uh, a quick mention for everybody who's emailed so far. Thank you so much. We've read them. We're just waiting to, to get back to you once, once the team behind the scenes have, have decided a bit more of an approach going forward. But I assure you that they are mobilizing support behind the scenes. There's lots of stuff going on behind the scenes, lots of meetings, um, lots of great ideas, which are going to be absolutely epic for all of us going forward. So thank you so much for, for tuning in today. Another amazing session awaits. And today we've got a different guest. You've had two Andy Cape sessions, Darby Boy himself. Now we're going to change it up a little bit. We've got me as the host and we've got a very special guest today. Susie Lavington, are you there, Susie? I am. Hello, Sand. How are you doing? Fantastic, Susie. Thanks so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Brilliant Derby. Before I ask you about Brilliant Derby, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. Susie Lambton, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there, which is absolutely fantastic. But for those who don't have the pleasure of knowing much about Susie Lambton so far, or not yet, please would you be able to share a little bit about yourself and, and the journey that you've been on? Yeah, yeah it's been quite, quite a journey, Sam. So I am uh, a mum First and foremost, I think I've got to get that in, in there. So my daughters are uh, one and four. So I've got a little Remy and I've got a little Amelie. Uh, so they are all consuming, <laughs> all consuming. Amelie's making a little way in the world and she's at primary school at the moment. Um, and Remy is uh, starting to, well, she's walking and she's she's starting to run actually, Sam. So I've got to have <laughs> 10,000 eyes in the back of my head. So that's kind of, I think, my main role at the minute. Um, but aside from all of that, uh, gosh, you know, I, I'm 37 years old. And I think, honestly, I'm just starting to come into my own. Just starting. I'm in scratching the surface. So um, for whatever reason, most of my life I've been... I've been enveloped in this little bit of fear, I'll be honest with you. Um, and I've played small, I think, for too much of my life, which is why um, the topic I'm going to talk about now or go on to in a few minutes fires me up so much because um, it's about finding your brave and it's about sort of shattering through those self-limiting beliefs. And I had lots of them. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm a work in progress. Um, but I started off my career in film production, always wanted to be an actor, but I was too scared to go to drama school. Um, eventually, I found the courage and I went and I made an almost living as an actor for 10 years um, but then I, I knew I wanted to have a family and I knew the safest thing to do would be to uh, get a proper job so that's what I did and I thought it was the end of the world at the time but actually it was a really interesting time in my life and in a very roundabout way that corporate career uh, led me to the art of brilliance because we had them in for a conference and they blew the roof off the place so I made it a very secret mission of mine to work with them one day and lots of hard work and lots of years later that became a reality so what are we now 2021 uh, and I've written a book with Dr Andy Cope which I still can't get my head around, called A Girl's Guide to Being Fearless. And that came out just before Christmas. And it's been a hell of a ride for the past couple of years. And here we are. That's, that, that's amazing, Susie. And, um, you know, it's fantastic to hear about, you know, your children and, and your career journey. But also, you know, that resonates with so many people. You know, like right now, there's, there's so much stuff going on. Of course, you know, the, the P word and, and the C word and all that kind of stuff. But there's so much stuff going on right now. And there are a lot of people thinking about what can I do? And maybe I have been playing this more, a lot of reflection. So this is a perfect time for your session. And then one more little question before I let you do, Susie, because I've seen your presentation. I know it's going to be absolutely amazing. And um, that question is, how does it feel to be involved in Brilliant Derby, a citywide programme? Oh, Sand, I think this is the start of something really 
special because as a trainer as a, a motivational speaker you whatever you want to call yourself and you'll know this and you know you go into one building generally when we're allowed or you'll be doing something online to one business or, or one school a lot of the time so you can affect you know the people within that organization or within that uh, education facility but to be able to do it citywide and particularly now when things are, you know, we, we don't want to labour the point, but we've been inside of this gloomy tunnel for quite a while now. <laughs> and so to be mm. able to do this and to, and to start something uh, of this scale uh, that has the potential to have just a massive reach is special to be a part of, for sure. Fantastic. Susie Lamington, thanks so much. I'm so excited for your session. So I'll see you in a few minutes, Susie, but have a blast and see you on the other side. Thank you, sir. Okay. So a, a big hello to everyone and welcome to the session, How to Find Your Brave, which is essentially about high self-esteem and deep down confidence. Two things I think we all need in big doses always and especially now. So the aim of, of this sort of next 15 minutes is to make it work as a bit of an inoculation not of the painful needle variety, you will be pleased to know, but rather the boost that you need to fight back when stress and anxiety rear their all too familiar heads. Because quite simply, the higher your levels of self-esteem and confidence, the more able you are to deal with fearful and stressful situations from a place of calm. So in this session, I'm going to introduce you to your inner critic the sneaky little perpetrator of all your stress and worry. I'm going to drag it out from its hiding place in the deepest, darkest corners of your mind. Then I'm going to give you some tips on how to talk back to it in a way that will make it shrivel and shush so that you can move forward in spite of it. And I'm going to show you how counting backwards can boost your confidence and supercharge your mojo and just show up for your life, show up for your life in the best way possible. First though, just a little bit of back story so that you can understand why getting my head around some of this stuff has changed so much for me and why this topic really fires me up as much as it does. So in my younger years, and I just mentioned it uh, to Sand a, a minute ago, I had dismally low self-esteem and therefore very little confidence. And when you are trying to make it as an actor, as I was in my 20s and early 30s, that is far from ideal. <laughs> so my straw that broke the camel's back moment, if you like, uh, came in my mid-20s when I landed a, a big opportunity but my nerves promptly kissed that opportunity goodbye. So I crashed and burned in an audition for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And that was a lifetime ambition for me back then. So that was it. I made a promise to myself there and then that I was going to at least try to get a hold of this debilitating fear that kept knocking me sideways because I didn't want to let an opportunity like that pass me by again. So I went on a little um, quest over the course of a few years. And I found some really powerful antidotes to my stresses and my fears. Um, and I, I poured every one of them into the book I wrote with Dr. Cope, a, a Girl's Guide to Being Fearless. But I've also poured a few of the best ones into this session so that you can use them and have them work for you too. So when I was an actor, I thought my nerves and my fears were just negative emotions that happened to me involuntarily. So just as an aside, I'll refer to emotions as positive or negative because that's the language we're used to, but emotions aren't really either. So definitely there are emotions that might feel better in our bodies versus others that feel less comfortable, but without the label, an emotion is just energy or vibrations moving around in our bodies. And emotions don't just happen to you. Um, they're not brought about by external situations. You create your feelings with your thoughts. You feel your thinking, and that's always the case. So emotions come from your thinking, never your circumstance. And I'm absolutely certain that wrapping your head around that concept is a game changer because your thoughts drive your emotions and your emotions drive everything you do or don't do. So fearful thoughts can cause overwhelm, but when your thoughts are calm, you feel calm, 
your head stays clear and you are able to access more solutions and operate as your better self more often. Okay, so I'm just want to I want to pick up on that word calm for a second. As many people think that the opposite of fear is confidence. When I would say it's actually calm. And calm comes from high 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 self-esteem, from knowing that whatever happens to you, you are all good. So self-esteem and confidence often confused as the same, but there's an important distinction between the two. So confidence comes from our abilities uh, or our belief in our own abilities, whether we expect to be good at something or not. And how confident we feel can vary massively depending on the situation that we are in. So some people are really sociable when they're with their friends, but they're painfully shy at parties. I know some people who are very confident at running their own business, but tell me they have zero confidence when it comes to how they dress or uh, at the thought of asking someone out. So self-esteem, on the other hand, is how you value and rate yourself overall. So esteem, as you can probably guess, comes from the word estimation. It is your self-estimation. It's not about specific situations. It is a feeling you carry with you all the time. And it's got a whole different energy. So if you have high self-esteem, you feel good about who you are. You know deep down you are loved, valued, worthy. You feel you are as deserving as everyone else. And when you feel like that, you are more willing to step outside of your comfort zone and try new things. Because even if you don't succeed at the thing you're trying, you're fine, okay? Because you, you know you're still loved, you're still valued and worthy. And what's more, you don't need anyone else's validation to prove it. You know that not being good at something just means you've got to practice to become better. So you allow yourself more opportunity to suck at more things so you can practice more things and then get better at more things. And that is when the confidence begins to creep in as you get better. Okay, so self-esteem comes first and then confidence follows. In fact, from high self-esteem, I would say that everything follows. So that's where we've got to start. All right, so I'm just going to bring my slides up at this point. Now, us humans have been gifted with wonderfully complicated brains and we overthink and we worry. And this worry shows up as our internal dialogue or our inner voice. We all have one. And if you've just said to yourself, no, I'm not sure I've got one of those, that's the rascal. That is the voice I'm talking about. It's the commentary that runs on in our head. And it's such a part of us that often we don't know that it's there. And even if we do know it's there, we're not usually very good at catching it and challenging it when it's talking against us. It's just something that plays on a uh, loop and we passively let it play, often without realizing that we're doing that either. And this is, this is definitely a simplification, but I want you to think of your inner voice as having two sides to its character, a critic and a coach, okay? So the critic is savage. It is your, I can't do it. No, I'm not capable enough. What will people think of me voice? It does have its uses, so it keeps us safe when we're in actual danger. But the problem for most of us is that it goes into overdrive in situations that aren't dangerous at all. And all it does in those instances is hold us back. And I would like you to think of the coach as the real you. So it's the part of your brain that goes, this is fine. You're all good. Come on. Sleeves up, chin up, let's go. So it's critic versus coach, fear versus courage. And the one you feed becomes the beast. Now you can't get rid of negative or unhelpful thoughts entirely. They'll always be there. Like I said, humans, messy brains, but that's good news. It just means that when a negative thought pops into your head, you don't have to worry. But what's important is knowing that when your critic feeds you rubbish, rather than falling down a rabbit hole of bad thinking that then la leads to bad feelings, you can sucker punch the critic and choose again. So you can choose to focus on different thoughts that will take you to a better place, all right? So three things that we need to do to upgrade a negative thought, to flip it from a place of freaking out or beating us up to supporting and motivating us. So firstly, just notice the thought and allow it to come. So tune into your inner voice. And when it gives you a negative suggestion, uh, notice if it tells you that the day ahead seems just too big to handle or that you can't do something or that you hate a part of yourself or that someone is thinking badly about you. And better still, write it down 
because bad thoughts like to fester in the dark corners of our minds. And just taking that second to catch them and call them out will shine a, a massive spotlight on them so that you can see them for what they really are, fiction stories and opinions that dramatic little critic likes to fabricate and then secondly forgive so forgive yourself for having the thought laugh at it bless it remember that a negative thought is just your brain doing its job and every single human has the same thing going on inside their head it's all good you are all good there is a saying that goes what you resist persists so beating yourself up or judging or worrying about a bad thought will only make it worse. So if you are feeling overwhelmed or stressed or scared or mad as hell, like lots of us have done over the past year, and the, but then if you're telling yourself off because you feel like you should be handling it or better, all that does is just shove a big old dollop of guilt or anger or shame on top of the initial worry and it can just creep and creep until it can become a bit too much. And I like to use the example of a snow globe okay so sometimes the negative thoughts can seem like they're coming in thick and fast okay and the inside of our heads can feel a bit stormy but usually if we just let the thoughts come we just let them in and we let them hang around for a bit they will pass and the storm will soon settle so calm is not the absence of negative thoughts it is our ability to witness ourselves having them and not freak out. Then, then you can shift the thought. So there are a number of ways to do it, but just with the time that we've got, um, we'll focus on the easiest thing that you can do, and that is to find the positive opposite of the negative thought. Okay, so some examples. If you wake up in the morning, and your critic pipes up with something along the lines of, oh, God, I'm so tired, or I'm so down or anxious, okay? And how many people say they wake up and the first thing that they think is, oh, God, I'm so tired. <laughs> and I'm gonna put my hand firmly up here. This is one I struggle with. Okay, what you can do is just notice the thought, yeah? And just say, okay, right, I feel this way, but I'm gonna flip it. And some people in their heads literally say stop or pivot, and I'm gonna replace it with something else. And that something might be, no, I'm in charge of how I feel. And today I choose to be happy or energized or hopeful. Now, if that is too far into bouncy, happy Tigger territory, or you're feeling at the lower end of your emotional scale, you could just tell yourself something like, no, come on, I'm okay with where I am right now, and all will be well. And then you can just focus on doing the next right thing, a la Frozen 2 for all of the parents of young children out there. And that next right thing, it might be as simple as brushing your teeth, having a cup of coffee, or getting dressed. So other examples of thought upgrades. So I'm not very confident might become, I can be as confident as I like with practice. I'm not very confident, not a fact. I can be as confident as I like with practice, closer to a fact. If you struggle with self-worth and you torment yourself with thoughts like, oh, I wish I was more like him or her, you can replace that with, I am better than no one. No one is better than me. Or I am enough exactly as I am right now. Now, when I get nervous, I tend to either overcompensate with false bravado and I get a bit loud, or I withdraw and I become subdued. So one of my favorite mantras to tell myself is, there is no need to shrink and there's no need to puff up. Just having that little word with myself is often all it needs or all I need to feel a bit more like me. And I find that for most negative thoughts, replacing them with this one to begin with can be really helpful. So this is only a thought and a thought can be changed. And you may already know this, but positive self-talk is otherwise known as affirming yourself. Now, believe me when I say that I can be a cynical grump if I let myself be. And when I first heard of affirmations, I thought they were a load of old rubbish. For years, I felt like that. How can saying a few fluffy sentences possibly have any effect on what goes on inside my brain? And more to the point, how can they have any effect on my life? And what I have finally come to understand, or at least surrender to, is that while most of the population tear themselves apart in the mirror each morning, the happy few do something different. They cheer themselves on, they have their own backs and they say nice things to themselves. So you don't have to call them affirmations if you don't want to. Reminders might sit better. And you don't have to say them to your reflection in the mirror. 
Some people do, and that's great. So others write them down and they mentally go through them. Some record them on their phones and they play them back to themselves when they're getting ready in the morning. Or failing all of that, you can just wake up and catch that critic before it starts a grumble. So it starts with its usual, oh my God, I'm so tired. Oh, I do not want to get out of bed. And you can just say, okay, yeah, but stop. I've been given another day on this planet and I refuse to start it with the hump. So today I choose to be happy or energized or optimistic or calm or whatever it is for you. And then instead of watching the news first thing, you can just stick on some music that shifts your vibe up a gear. And all of a sudden your day has gotten off to a flyer. Your self-esteem has everything to do with the way you talk to yourself inside of your own head. Okay, that's where it begins and ends. You talk to you more than anyone else on the planet. So as often as possible, team up with yourself. It changes everything. Now they say the most used phrase of 2020 <laughs> was, you're on mute. We could probably all have guessed that. But what if in 2021, every time that inner critic piped up, we met it with, sorry, can't hear you. You're on mute because we absolutely have the power to do that. And the more you practice shutting that critic up, the more it shrinks and the more your self-esteem will soar. And as I said before, from there, the gaps open up for the confidence to creep in. So onto that confidence piece of the puzzle. The key to growing in confidence in any area of your life is to stretch, but not panic. So a guy called Carl Ronke came up with something called the comfort stretch panic model. So every activity we find easy or relaxing falls inside of our comfort zone. Now outside of that is our stretch zone. And those are activities that make us slightly to moderately nervous, but that we can do without going to pieces. Now beyond that is our panic zone. So that is proper wobbler territory. So inside the realm of panic would be things we daren't even try because the very thought of them makes us want to find the nearest cave and hide in it. So the key to growing in, in confidence in any area of your life is to move out of your comfort zone and into your stretch zone, but stop before you reach panic. So attempting something too scary too soon could just see you crack under the pressure and just give you a horrible aversion to trying again, but a smidge of uneasiness is a good thing. So moving into stretch, doing something something that gives you a little flurry of the jitters at least once a day is a pretty good motto to live by. So what we'll look at now is a technique we can use when we are in our stretch zones and we begin to feel that fear. So something we can do to stop it getting such a hold of us that we can move forward in spite of it. So a couple of years ago, I learned this very powerful mind trick, and I've been using it ever since to get an instant confidence boost when I'm about to do something that scares me. And I have borrowed it from uh, an author and speaker called Mel Robbins, and it's called the five second rule. And the simple premise of it is this. So whenever an event happens that requires you to take an action you know you should take, but don't want to, Time begins to pass while you mull it over. So the longer you leave it before taking action or the longer that gap of time, the more likely it is that the gap gets filled with dread and anxiety and self-doubt and overwhelm. And those feelings will take you out. So the event happens. For Mel, actually, when she discovered this rule, it was just the alarm going off in the morning and her having to face the day. For you, it could be having to have a difficult conversation with somebody or ask something from someone who intimidates you or start some exercise or clean the house. Might be mine. <laughs> and if you give yourself too much time to think, you will talk yourself out of it. So that lovely critic we talked about will come up with all sorts of very plausible excuses. Now, I'm too tired. I'm too scared. Now, I'm not in the mood. I'll do it later. Yada, yada. And we put off. And the opportunity's gone. And we put off. And we put off. And we watch our lives happen to us rather than making stuff happen for us. It is, I know, such a laughably simple concept. Count back from five. But it works every time. Because you get to the action before that shouty inner critic gets a chance to talk you out of it. So you rediscover the version of you and your brilliance before it got covered with layer upon layer of self-made fear. So 
anytime you know you've got to do something, but you don't feel confident enough to do it. And you feel yourself hesitating and that doubt and that dread creeping in and you start to talk against yourself. Slam on the brakes, sucker punch the critic, count back from five, five, four, three, two, one, then do one thing. Take one action. Sit up in bed. Say that first sentence in the meeting. Put your trainers on, go for a run. Whatever it is, just take the first step. And then the rest of the steps take care of themselves because you are off. You are doing it. Okay. <laughs> now, a little heads up. A couple of things to think about when using the rule. A couple of things to bear in mind. Don't count out loud when you're around other people because they might worry. And don't count up because that's how we've been taught to count. It uses the autopilot part of our brain rather than the part of our brain we need to change behavior. Okay. So there's a whole science behind this. I highly recommend Mel's book, but just remember five, four, three, two, one, take one action and your comfort zone will not see you for dust. All right. So quick recap of all the tips that we've gone through to help you find your brave. Above all, have your own back. When your critic feeds you rubbish, notice the thought, forgive it, and then you can shift it. Stretch, but don't panic. So take little steps into your stretch zone that give you little flurries of the jitters. And then when you're there and you feel the fear, count to five backwards and take one action. Okay, I think this quote from Jerry Larkin sums this session up brilliantly. Calmness is a huge gift. And once you master it, you will be able to respond in a useful way to every difficult situation that decides to walk into your life. Now, I want you to see calm as your superpower, something you get to tap into whenever you want, because there is an enormous gulf between the events of the world and what we do with them. Out there and in here, are two very different domains. And you can't control any of what goes on out, out there, but let it free and empower you to know that you only really live in here. And thankfully, this is the domain that you are master of. People, places, and things outside of us are not accountable for how we feel inside of us. So no one, however outrageously they behave, and no thing, however big or scary it may seem, has the right or the ability, actually, to, to, to control or change how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your day, okay? So you get to flick all the switches in here. And as often as possible, flick the ones that make you feel good and everything else becomes so much easier. And when you consciously focus on the good, the good gets better. So that is me and that is how to find your brave. Thank you. Susie Lavinson in the house. Susie, Susie, Susie. Wow. I'm uh, feeling a lot more pumped up after that. Well, I want to well, say, obviously, thank, thank you so much for, for an awesome session and, uh, you know, distilling, you know, what goes on in our minds. And, and, you know, I've spent so many years thinking about what happens. And, and this has really, really helped to for me to understand what actually happens when I feel, feel certain things. You know, when I'm presented with a situation, okay, is this happening right now? And like you said, that ability just to take a step back, let it pass, and then move forward again is, is really, really powerful. But what I want to ask you is one question. Um, that question, Susie, is for everybody at home now, for everybody at home who's watching this, or for people who work or watching this, or wherever you know, anybody in Derby is watching this right now, what's one thing that they can think about? Or as like a little activity? Or what would you say to me or anybody in Derby now? Just, just how can I take this? Use it practically in my life. Give me a little bit of a challenge. Give me a bit of an activity. Okay, yeah. Um, so the, the the slide that had the comfort, stretch, and panic zones, those three circles, yeah, you could probably replicate that nice and easily. You know, do it in your, your own way. Um, but if you sort of literally draw three circles on a, on a sheet, yeah, comfort, stretch, and panic, label them as they were on that slide. And just think to yourself, right, what thing do I want to achieve? But the idea of it scares me a little bit. Yeah, it could be a lot. <laughs> and think, okay, right. Now, if I have that goal in mind, that end goal, what steps towards that goal would I be happy taking now? Yeah, so, you know, say you wanted a career change, for example, right? It's a big mm -hmm. one, okay, but that was an example. Um, and you might think, okay, well, right now, 
what I could easily do, the things that I find comfortable would be, would be just doing a bit of research online, maybe looking at some people who are already in that job or that industry, and maybe making a list of potential contacts, for example. Yeah. And then think, okay, right. So that next zone, that stretch go stretch zone, what would make me feel uncomfortable? What would give me a, a little flurry of the nerves? Not so that it makes your heart pound or makes you feel like running away. Um, and then think about some steps that you would write in there. OK, for that particular mm -hmm. goal. And then for that panic zone, think right now, what would get my heart totally pounding? What would be a bit too scary to deal with mm -hmm. now? OK, so in, in they go. So if it was a fitness goal, for example. Um, that uh, panic zone might be to run a marathon. <laughs> OK, so you've got your three zones and then just look at the, the actions in your stretch zone. And maybe give yourself a little bit of a, a goal, like a, a, a miniature goal and think, right, by the end of next week, I want to have taken mm. one of those action steps. OK, and then think, take those steps, pick one of them and then use that mind trick of counting backwards from five and then taking that very first step. So that's what I could leave you with as an activity. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and again, you know, the email address as, as you've seen it throughout the show, but what we'd love to do is um, is see, you know, your zones. We'd like to see your your comfort zone. We'd like to see your stretch zone. We'd like to see panic zone, and also share some stories. You know, share some stories about how this goes for you. But Susie, thanks so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see you again, and and thank you so much for for sparking your brave and your brilliance on on Derby today. And again, for everybody who wants to get involved with Brilliant Derby, we'd love to hear from you. Please carry on emailing us, and for those who have emailed so far. We're going to come back to you very, very soon. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks for a session with Martin, who's uh, another one of our brilliant team members. But until then, take care, stay safe and see you soon.